introduce to you today our um, newest member of the faculty, uh, Rai Gahani, who's a distinguished career professor here at Carnegie Mellon. He's jointly appointed between the machine learning department and Heinz College. So Raid has an interest, as you all know, in developing and using computational and data analysis and machine learning for the public good. He works on problems such as criminal justice, education, healthcare, energy, economic development, and so on. Uh, Raid got his start, or I guess his claim to fame, in 2012 when he was the chief scientist for Barack Obama's campaign, and he pioneered a successful way to approach data in support of the campaign and kind of revolutionized um, politics as, as we know it today. Raid was also the founding director of the Center for Data Science and Public Policy at the Higher School at the University of Chicago. And we're excited to welcome him back home, as it, as it, as it were, to Carnegie Mellon. Um, Raid got his master's degree here in the machine learning department. So welcome home, and we're excited to hear you talk about your work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I want to introduce actually Kit, uh, Kit Rodolfo, who is a research scientist also. He has been working um, on these types of problems with me for a few years in different organizations, including campaigns, uh, startups, and the University of Chicago. So feel free to, um, you know, I'm here, he's here, we're going to be around. So ask questions during the talk, but also come talk to us. You know, we're going to be on campus, you know, I'm here all the time. So happy to chat with people, work with uh, people. And, um, so I thought what we could do was talk through um, some projects that, that have been going on in, in this area. Um, I usually use all the buzzwords that, you know, um, for now, data science, AI, machine learning, any other things you want to include, just keep adding it. Uh, that way, making search becomes easier. Uh, you, you know, if you're searching for one word and you haven't heard the other one, it'll still come up. Uh, and that's really the only reason for putting these words. Um, is, is just to make sure people people have uh, one of the things that was I think John was telling me that there's another talk going on with the CIO of uh, DOJ, so that's a really good classification problem of you know people who care about <laughs> things and people who care about things or human beings. Uh, so <laughs> you guys are the the, the hope uh, for the for the world. Uh, I'm also being reminded that I'm I'm, I'm being streamed and recorded. Um, which, oh well. Uh, Anyway, so let's start talking about um, some, so what I want to do is kind of talk through some of the projects to give you a flavor for what types of things we've been working on, and then give you an idea of what we're trying to do here. Um, how are ways, what are the different ways to, to work with us, right? And, and there are going to be kind of three types of uh, things that, that we want to pe get people involved. One is we're going to be teaching classes at this intersection. There's going to be a, a, a class next semester, um, which is going to be a machine learning for public policy lab, which is going to be a project class where we'll work on real problems with government agencies and nonprofits um, using all these different buzzwords. Um, the second, and then in addition to that, we're going to be running the Data Science with Social Good program. I'll talk more about that. We've been running for the last seven summers. Um, it's going to be happening at Pittsburgh next, next summer. Um, and then, um, so that's one way is to work through classes. The second is there are going to be a lot of projects happening throughout the semesters outside classroom. And people who are interested in these types of projects, again, they're all collaborative projects with a government agency or a nonprofit. Um, come talk to us, get involved. The third way is, is research um, problems. Um, the, the difference between the, the projects and the research was going to be projects going to be, you know, very applied, working with a specific organization, a partner to solve a problem. And then that motivates a lot of open questions um, that can't be solved by off-the-shelf methods and solutions. So the research is going to be motivated by that, tackling those, those problems, but then incorporating back into tools and methodologies and these projects. So those are kind of the three areas people can get involved in take, through classes, through working on projects with us, and then through, through research. Um, I'll go through some projects. Some of you may have heard about some of those projects. Um, if you, um, and some of them are kind of newer projects. The, one of my favorite ones I talk about quite a bit because it's, it's an interesting story of sort of, it's tech, you know, from the machine learning side and data science side, it's really simple. Um, but this is around lead poisoning. This was work that we started about four years, five years ago. Um, and it was with, 
It's specific to Chicago here, but it's not a Chicago problem. A lot of you are probably familiar with lead poisoning because of flint uh, and water pipes. Uh, it turns out that's not the major cause of lead poisoning. The major cause is paint in walls, doors, and windows. Um, and the way, so pretty much every home built before 1977 has lead paint in there, which is bad, but not horrible as long as the paint stays in the wall. But as homes get old, paint starts chipping. Um, kids tend, you know, when they start crawling, they pick up lead dust, put it in their mouth, and pretty horrible things happen. Um, and the worst thing is that all of these effects are irreversible. Once you have exposure to lead, and your, your blood level, uh, lead level goes up, there's nothing you can do to fix these problems. Um, the standard policy most places use, including Chicago, is to wait until get, you get lead poisoning and then fix the cause. Uh, we can imagine that's a pretty horrible policy, right? So what Chicago specifically does, and other Pittsburgh is not any better, <laughs> um, uh, is uh, they, every kid before they go to school gets tested for lead. If they find elevated levels of blood, uh, lead in the blood, they notify the health department. The health department then sends a team of uh, lead inspectors to their house. They drill into your walls and doors and windows to get samples, they test them. Um, and about 90% of the time they find lead because how else would the kid have gotten lead poisoning in the first place? And then they figure out ways to remediate that problem, painting over, replacing doors, replacing windows, which is wonderful for the kids who are going to live in that house in the future. But the kid that just got poisoned, was, you know, there's nothing we can, we can do about that. Um, um, so I often sort of, it's a horrible thing to say, but I describe it as we use kids as lead sensors to detect lead, and then we fix the problem. Um, because essentially, that's, that's the policy today. Um, now, to their credit, um, they realized that was an issue and they said well we would like to fix every home we don't have money um, and they're not the DOD right uh, so we'd like to figure out how can we prioritize which homes to fix and and there's sort of a longer story of you know how we figure out but basically what we were able to do was work with them to take the lucky you know in a lot of these types of problems there is a lot of data that's sitting there that's not being used for these types of analyses, right? So the two data sources they had, one was every blood test that was done over the last 10, 15 years was stored. Um, so the kid, the, their age, their address, and the, the, the lead level in their blood. And then every home inspection that was triggered as a result of that was also stored. Uh, so most of it was electronic, some of it was you know, PDFs. It's the bane of every you know, data analysis projects. Uh, but if, so the idea was to, if we can combine them, can we predict at when a kid is two months old, three months old, basically before they turn one, before they turn, before start crawling, can we predict that this kid is going to be at risk of being exposed to lead in this house? And if there is a high enough risk, can we then just move the inspection to earlier? And so doing it after poisoning, can we do it before the poisoning? Um, so fairly simple change from the process side and relatively simple from, the, from the, the data analysis side and the machine learning side. It's, can we combine these things and, and we sort of use other, other data as well. Um, so we kind of built that initial system and ran a, a randomized trial to sort of see whether it actually does, you know, yes, we can predict uh, uh, on historical data, but does it actually generalize into the future? Does it result in, in finding more homes with lead hazards than, than without um, compared to sort of other things. But then the second thing was how do we now start being more proactive about this, right? So one was uh, triggering inspections as a result of these predictions, triggering proactive inspections. Second one was they're now working with a hospital system and they've done is implemented this into the electronic health records so that when a pregnant woman comes in for a checkup, it, does the same check and raises an alert if the kid that's going to be born is going to be at risk. So now the health department has more time to plan, allocate resources, figure out where they need to go, what they need to do. Um, and sort of that, some of that is kind of, you know, we're extending it to some other things. But that's a really simple example of if we can identify early a problem, then we have more time and, and the cost to fix it is the same, right? It's the same uh, inspection before, after. It's just the impact is much, 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 much higher because you're, you're 
saving uh, a kid as opposed to saving you know, some net present value of future kids who are going to be saved who live in that house. So that's kind of one example. Another project that's kind of deployed, actually Allegheny County has been replicating some of this work for the last couple of years and, and working on similar things. So that's kind of part of the goal is taking these examples, building these tools, and then making them available open source with a lot of uh, with, um, uh, documentation so that they can actually reuse these type of things as opposed to keeping it in one place. Um, second example, um, another depressing one, right? This is police misconduct. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's a local problem here, but it's also you know, it's a local problem. And I was in Chicago, and it's, it's all over the, the country where a lot of police departments um, have had uh, a lot of issues with police violence, shootings, use of force. Um, and one of the things that was surprising to me when I first started looking at this was most police departments, most large departments, have a system implemented, installed, that they call an early intervention system. And what the system is supposed to do is raise a flag alert when an officer is at risk of doing something bad. When they built these systems and implemented them and spent way too much money on them, they never really bothered to actually test if they worked or not. Well, they actually tested it. So it's funny, I was t we were talking to New Orleans when, so there are these things called consent decrees where often the Department of Justice or what used to be the Department of Justice would um, basically sue a police department for civil rights violations and then they would reach a settlement but they would have to change certain things and that's called a consent decree. And so it turns out these are actually all the, you know, the, the consent decrees that existed uh, until 2016. And most of them actually, some of them still exist, some of them have kind of gone away um, because they haven't been enforced. But it turns out one of the departments, this was New Orleans, um, when they implemented one of these systems, this was a couple of years back, I asked them, they said, oh, it's going to go into pilot. We're going to evaluate it starting next week. So I asked them, what are you evaluating? I think, well, we want to evaluate, um, can you log in? Uh, does it come up when we go in? Uh, does the screen look you know, readable? Uh, so those are the evaluation metrics for a system that's supposed to detect officers who are at risk of, of shooting and use of force. Right? That's uh, because they're looking at it from a very different, like, does the IT system do, does, does it do what it's supposed to do and not is it effective at the policy outcomes that we're trying to achieve? Um, and so the first thing we did was actually work with a few different departments. We focused on one, which is Charlotte Mecklenburg in North Carolina. And we just, they worked with us to, to, to they gave us all their data, everything about officers, HR, training, employment, stops, dispatches, arrest, internal affairs, complaints, everything. And step one was to see, well, how well does this system work today? And it turns out the way they built the system was like a lot of large government IT systems are built, which is a few people sitting around a table making ad hoc decisions. Right? Um, so this one was, um, well, let's, let's see what could be predictive of these types of things. Well, let's, let's say if they had more than three uses of force in the last 90 days, that must be bad. So let's raise a flag. What about six complaints in the last 180 days? Let's do that. And then, you know, it's the US, so if you took more than two weeks off, uh, that's m something must be really wrong with you. So those were the three three rules, and that's kind of the state of the art right now, or until now, pretty much. Um, you get this, you know, wonderful .NET interface where you have six boxes, you know, number of number of complaints in some period of time, number of use of force in some period. You fill it, fill that, and that's it, right? So when we evaluated the system, um, it turns out it was flagging more than half the police officers in the department. So completely useless right at that point. Nobody trusted it. Nobody really used it. it if anything, it was also, it was kind of being treated as, as a badge of honor. Hey, I did stuff. And I, because I did things, I'm on this list. Um, it was also, the, it also had the opposite effect of when people got close, because they knew that they were going to be monitored with this metric, when they got close to that threshold, they stopped doing things. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them. Actually. A lot of officers we talked to who said, yeah, I'm, I'm close to this. I don't want to you know, raise a flag, so I'm just going to not do anything today. Um, so completely ineffective. Um, and so after flagging about a little over half the officers, it was still not finding maybe 50-something percent of the ones who are going to go on to do these things. So pretty much close to random was how well it was working. Um, 
So we kind of did the same process as we did with the lead poisoning. Hey, can, if we can detect early, uh, actually early, who these officers are going to be who are at risk, can we then figure out what interventions are going to be effective um, at reducing their risk of being involved in all these things? Right. So we combine all of that data, and um, we. I'm kind of skipping over all that. There's a lot of interesting things which we can talk about at a later stage of. How do you get the police departments to actually work with you? How do you deal with the unions? How do you design these policies? How, all that stuff that's, that's useful and interesting if you want to do this type of work, which we can talk about at a different time. Um, but we can combine this and, and build a system to predict an officer's risk of being involved in one of these activities over the next, let's say, 12 months. And then the idea was to provide this risk score to the police department to then figure out how do we change that? Because it's great that we can predict these things. But we don't want to predict this officer is going to shoot somebody and then watch it happen. Right? We'd like to stop that from happening. And, and it wasn't, so one of the, for example, a couple of things we found that were important predictors that were more contextual and kind of more situational. So one of them was repeated dispatches to suicide attempts, um, repeated dispatches to domestic abuse cases, especially involving kids. And when people had those, several of those in a short period of time, they became high risk of shooting, use of force in the next some period of time. And those are you know, some proxies for um, stress. And if there's a way, you know, it's not, you're not going to fire them because of that. You, you might need to give them counseling, a cool down period. You might need to figure out, should we not dispatch them to another one of these if they just came back from something like this last yesterday, the week before. Um, and so that system right now, so, well, we again ran this trial to, to check for how well it was working. And then now we've, it's implemented in a couple of different police departments where they're using it um, to, to you know, raise these alerts, to review them, and then to, to intervene and, and collecting that data. So we're going to continue working with them to evaluate and see, does it actually reduce the risk of these officers doing them? Um, and, and so that's, you know, if people are interested in that, those types of projects, right, like th those are collaborations that, that we're going to have now at CMU to be able to work with these. Or so for example, on this one with um, Charlotte, as well as a couple other departments. Um, um, and actually, that system right now, we've, we've licensed it to a startup who's building this as a product to try to, give, uh, to sell to, to different police departments to be able to scale what we're doing, but then making the data available back to us for research purposes to be able to see what works across the country at different departments in terms of reducing the risk of these types of things. Um, uh, actually, so there's a whole class of projects that, that are, so the first two were kind of these early warning systems, right? Things that are going to happen um, that are bad. If we can detect them early, hopefully we have an intervention that can reduce or, or rem you know, remove that or re stop that from happening. Then there's a whole class of problems that are kind of what I call sort of inspection problems, where it's not a prediction problem. It's a, I have certain things that are happening in the world. So there are um, facilities, manufacturing facilities that are disposing hazardous waste in, in ways that they shouldn't be doing. Right? They're throwing it in the river, they're dumping it in the backyard. Um, or there are office workspaces that are not being, they're not, you know, they have health and safety violations. Or they're rental housing units where the landlords are not keeping them in, in decent shape and, 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 and the renters really can't do anything about it. So they're all sort of, they're not prediction things. It, it, it's sort of a detection type problem where it's happening today. And then I have regulatory agencies that need to inspect these types of places, right? So this is some work with an agency used to be called EPA, you know. Uh, their goal used to be protecting the environment. Um, and um, so this was some work with them to figure out which facilities should they inspect um, to, to reduce the number of violations of hazardous waste uh, disposal. Uh, another project we were doing was with the government of Chile um, on inspecting workplaces um, for health and safety violation. Another project was with San Jose on, on looking at um, rental properties that were uh, again, had had safety um, issues, and so all of those that those are kind of interesting set of problems because for a few different reasons. One is most regulatory agencies they kind of try to optimize for efficiency. The way they frame the problem is we can inspect a thousand places. How do we figure out which ones to inspect so we find as many problems as possible? 
except they need to, you know the total number of, of things they need to inspect is let's say 400,000 facilities or 300,000 homes if they inspect a thousand and they find thousand problems that has nothing to do with how many problems exist in the overall set so the overall policy goal is deterrence it's to reduce the number of violations on the full set the tool they have is these thousand inspections and they're often maximizing their violation rate on this and hoping that it results in maximizing the the the, the deterrence rate on this, but there's no there's no guarantee, right? So a lot of it is trying to figure out how do we use these thousand um, to reduce the, the the rate of of violations on the larger set um, when you can't really inspect everything because you, you can't even get a baseline on how many problems are there. So how do you use that? So there's some interesting problems there, both from the practice side but also from the from the research side. Um, there's some work that we've been doing with school districts around the country on. Again, early warning type things on for different types of educational outcomes, whether it's not graduating from high school within five years or not making it to reading grade level for kids in third grade, because that's sort of this key point, um, uh, to students who may, may be graduating um, and getting into college but are not going to make it graduate from college. Um, um, or kids who are undermatching um, college, so they they're they're getting in, they're applying to colleges that that are that have a low graduation rate. They can apply to colleges with a higher rate graduation rate, but don't because they don't know how to. Um, they don't have the resources to. They don't have the information. So a lot of these educational outcomes that are bad for them, how do we detect them early, and then how do we uh, reduce the risk of people? Um, this is also somewhere we started last year with um, El Salvador. Uh, very similar things. They have a very high dropout rate from from schools. So how do we identify children who are at risk, and then prioritize interventions at the very micro level to figure out how to reduce reduce the risk there. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is some work with Mexico, uh, CEDESOL, which is their social service agency. Um, this was again a couple of years back, trying to match people who might be in need of social services who are not applying, who don't know how to apply. And or people who are getting services that they may not be eligible for, how do you how do you do better um, matching uh, type things, different programs? Um, this is actually a project going on right now, um, which is with a county in Kansas, Johnson County, and and so these numbers are not just for the county. <laughs> this is this is for the whole country, which is uh, pretty horrible, right? Eleven million people go through jails. This is just jail, not prison, uh, and. What's depressing are the, the, the bottom three numbers, right? All, the, all these people, two thirds of them have mental health issues, substance abuse issues, other health, chronic health problems. Um, so um, the, the, the problem this county came to us with was they said we have a really high recidivism rate. Um, and we think that a lot of it is because of mental health issues that, that these people have. So what we'd like to do is we have a team of people who can do proactive outreach to connect them with mental health services and other types of social services they might need. Can you help us identify the people who we should direct these resources to? Um, and so step one was trying to figure out about what data can, do we have that allows us to, to figure out who might, one, be at risk of recidivism, two, have mental health needs. Um, and this kind of project has been happening for a few years in, in different iterations. And, so the most recent iteration of the, the, that we had, they, they, they got data from the, the criminal justice system, the, the jail, prison, mental health data, um, EMS dispatch data, because that's a lot of the, the people um, in this pool, and you know, call EMS uh, a lot, hospital data, and linking all of that together to figure out, can we predict somebody's risk of recidivism, um, in, and the police data, sorry. Um, to jail, and then can we look at their history to see if there's a mental health need? And we found sort of in our first step is yes, we can fairly accurately predict who's going to be at risk of coming back to jail. Now the second question again in all of these problems is can we do anything about it? And so um, June we started a pilot with them where we're giving them a list of people every month. It's a randomized trial where, and they're going out and doing this mental health outreach and then we're getting this data back. So over the next 12 months, we're going to measure um, the, the reduction in recidivism rate off the people we, you know, we predicted um, to see, is the intervention effective at all in general? And is the intervention effective for certain 
risk levels. Um, because if it's only useful for mid-risk level, then we should do that and figure out something different for the high risk and the lower risk and, and, and so on. Uh, so that's a project that's going on right now. Again, people are getting involved and getting, getting in, interested in getting involved. You know, let us know. Um, uh, last example I want to give before we move to um, a couple other things. This is a project that we, it was a sort of a <coughs> short prototyping project we did last summer is the, in, in the summer program. This is with Jakarta, where they have a few thousand traffic deaths every year. Right? So there's a lot of, I don't know if anybody here heard about in the US this program, Vision Zero, where they want to get traffic deaths to zero. There aren't, luckily, there aren't that many traffic deaths here. And so there's sort of very little you can do on the data side to really do these types of things. Whereas in the countries like <coughs> Indonesia, it's a much, much, much bigger problem. So one of the things they did uh, was, well, we should figure out what the, why this, these accidents are happening. So like every smart city does, they installed a bunch of cameras. Uh, and then they came back and said, well, we have 5,000 cameras in the city. We don't know what to do with them. Uh, because you know cameras don't make you smarter. It's like if you had a bunch of eyes, <laughs> you wouldn't really be smarter than you are now, right? Uh, but that's what we call smart cities, and you know it's the people, it's cities with lots of hands and arms, you know, lots of sensors, uh, is what makes you smart apparently. Uh, so what we sort of, what they were interested in was, there were two things, right? It's a lot of people in the in the government and the policy world, for them, da data is something that comes in rows and columns. Uh, and if it's not in a row and column, it's like, oh, it's, I don't have data on this. Like, you do. It's just video or audio or text. And so step one was really trying to help them figure out how do they take these 5,000 cameras and structure it in a way that they can then do their analysis for root cause for these accidents. What are the things that are leading up to these accidents? What are the causes? And so they're detecting events like you know non-vehicles using roadways, so food cart vendors uh, bring Motorcycles that have, you know, again, I, I grew up in Pakistan, so motorcycles look like this, right? It's like bags and two kids hanging from the sides. And, uh, uh, and, and one of the things was when you actually start taking some of the, the computer vision tools that are trained on the US traffic data, they can't detect some of these things. Because uh, that's not a motorcycle from a US uh, object detection model. Um, even, I mean, this is, you know, even if you modify so some work we were doing last summer, this summer actually in London, just buses, the, the, the US bus model doesn't work on London buses. They're, they're too tall and too narrow. So tiny little changes. Um, and so we have to kind of do a lot of work to sort of train these things, pedestrians going the wrong way, you know, crossing in the middle, that's just life. Um, cars going the wrong way on the sidewalks, again, pretty normal behavior. But it, it's, it, they're not pre-built things that exist for these types of problems. And so one of the things we did was sort of det build these detectors that are, what are these objects, which direction are they moving in, and where are they moving? Are they moving on the road? Are they moving on the sidewalk? Um, to be able to then kind of generate a, a, a database of these events that can sort of detect so things like this, right? So this is a, this is a two-way street. Um, and, and if you sort of start detecting cars coming the wrong way or people coming and then now connect it to accidents happening, you now have, have data that you can use to figure out what should you be doing. Is it, is it changing policy? Is it enforcing policy? Is it you know, maybe putting a little median divider in the middle here? That's going to be uh, a simple fix that stops things from happening if the accident's actually happening. So it's another kind of example of one of these projects. Um, there are many, 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 many more projects. Uh, this, and, and so if you're interested, they're kind of on, on this website from the Summer, summer Fellowship um, and other places. Um, and they span sort of you know, all these different areas, criminal justice, health, uh, social services, education, public safety, sustainability. Uh, they're with governments, they're with nonprofits, federal, international, local. So, so it's a good way to kind of figure out what, what's going on, what are people trying to do, what kinds of problems um, governments and NGOs are facing in these things, and, and how can we use all these different buzzwords that we're talking about to, to tackle some of these problems. Right? They're going to be a small part of the solution. Right? They're not going to be the, it's not going to be you install uh, machine learning and it's going to solve problems. Uh, and, and some of the people you'll run into in government might think that. 
Like I was, I was giving a talk a few months back to a bunch of people in, in city government and gave all these examples. And then somebody sort of raised their hand and said, so why are you not using machine learning? And said, so tell me what you mean by that. He said, well, like machine learning, you know, you put data in and it just answers questions. <laughs> um, and you're telling me that you have to sort of think about the problem, formulate it, and you know, structure your data, build these things, validate. Like if you just use machine learning, like why aren't you doing that? And, and it's because they're either talking to some vendor who's telling them that, uh, or they're reading some article in New York Times or Wired that's telling them, you know, there's magic. You put these things in and magic comes out. Um, and, and people like us who are gonna be working with them and saying, well, no, this is gonna take you know, a year to prototype and a year to, to, to do trials and then it's gonna take a year to implement. But I can just go to that vendor and install Watson, right? Uh, and, and, and that's, so we're gonna have to, learn, have to learn how to talk to them about, no, 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 you still have to have good data. You still have to think about the problem. You still have to set up this system that's, that's sort of connecting your policy outcomes with the metrics you design here. And, and all of that is, um, well, one, it's all you know, manual, <laughs> it's not automated. But then two, it requires an understanding of what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, and a lot of these things, right, so for the things that, that are about human, I think we're trying to do kind of three things here, right? We're trying to understand often human behavior, recidivism, school graduation, um, lead poisoning, um, and all these different police misconduct. Um, and then we're trying to, because our goal is not just to understand and admire understanding, right? Our goal is to ideally change something. We want to usually predict what's going to happen next with these people. Who are the people who are going to be at risk of these types of outcomes? And then we're trying to influence those outcomes, and then we keep going, right? And and that's sort of you know historically, this has kind of lived in the stats world, where a lot of descriptive analysis, a lot of understanding of let's take some data and really figure out how. Um, and some social science. This one historically, again, has lived in the machine learning world, in the computer science world of let's predict, 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 and then watch bad things happen. Um, and a lot of social science has kind of and, and lived in, in causal inference where we're trying to change um, behavior. And in order to solve sort of any problem that we talked about, you kind of need all three. You're not going to be able to just live in this world um, or in this world and, and keep running a bunch of randomized controlled trials without thinking about, you know, how do I prioritize the ones who need my help? How do I figure out, uh, deal with large amounts of data about them? And so that's, that's the, you know, and there's a lot of work happening in these areas now, but, but that's sort of the intention is to, is to think about how do we build these large scale systems that are trying to solve um, important problems, but, but by bringing in people and, and research um, from different disciplines to create something that that's can you know, solve the whole thing, right? So a couple of things that you know, we're gonna be doing, right? So there are three areas that I kind of gave you a preview of, right? One is courses and, and classes that we're gonna be doing. Um, and again, very much along the lines of the different areas, right? Here, kind of, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but here, it, this is sort of a minimum list of skills that, that people need in order to be effective uh, in this type of work. Right? If you actually want to have an impact, you can't just live um, here or here or here. Uh, you're gonna have to cross buildings, uh, and and you know again, if you want to, you know, you might have really good programming skills and machine learning skills, but if you're not gonna understand how to communicate, uh, and if you don't know how to actually design an experiment to show that your impact is, is doing something, and if you don't understand the legal issues around using particular data, changing policy, or the ethics of what you're doing, um, it's not gonna be effective. So, so the idea is a lot of the coursework that we're trying to do is not making everybody an expert at everything. It's to, you're gonna have one of depth in one or more of these areas, but you're gonna have, have exposure and understanding of a lot of them so that you can collaborate with people with those skills effectively. The idea is not that everybody becomes an expert in all of them, but trying to build teams that have depth of expertise in these areas, but can work together because they understand the vocabulary, they understand the language, they understand the value 
off to other fields. Um, so that's, those are kind of the types of, you know, this is one skill that we just don't teach typically in universities very much. Um, we give people nicely well-defined problems because it's easier to grade. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's a really important skill because you're not gonna see that coming from when you go out and work with governments or NGOs. You're not gonna find, none of the problems I talked about came the way I talked about them. Um, one of the things I'm also planning on doing is we're gonna try to run this, this thing that we've been doing in Chicago, which is called a Scopathon, which is um, basically having a set of governments and nonprofits coming in. Um, and instead of making a useless map or a dashboard that nobody will use, um, we'll help them define their problem better so that they can solve it. How do we scope these projects? And how do we teach people to scope them? Because that's the biggest bottleneck we find is people come and they need help, but they haven't thought about how to define and scope their, their problems. Uh, after that, they can build their useless map and dashboard. Uh, <laughs> but at least they'll first have, you know, what's the problem they're solving? And, uh, so that's kind of one, there's gonna be a, a class that we're teaching um, next semester. It's gonna be uh, a uh, machine learning public policy lab, then we're, we're just working on the name yet. It's gonna be a joint class between Heinz and machine learning department. Um, so people who are interested, um, keep an eye on that. And the idea would be to make teams that are gonna work on um, real problems with governments and NGOs, real data, and then trying to build um, at least going through the whole system, kind of beginning formulating a problem to, to, to you know, building something. Um, the second is this summer program that um, is going on the last few summers is gonna be, we're gonna be running at CMU next summer. Uh, and then there's some other courses we've been doing over the last few, this is the program in, in collaboration with NYU and University of Maryland, that's basically the same type of thing for people in government. Um, because if we're kind of getting all of you ready to kind of go work with them, we have to kind of also get them familiar with um, how to incorporate people like you into their workflow. I have to, to understand how to work with, with, with people with these skills. Um, and then sort of there are a lot of, uh, you know, the focus for a lot of these research is going to be more at this, and, and the work is going to be at the, how do we build entire systems? It's not necessarily how do we build a better machine learning model because the model is somewhat um, not completely the same as, as the system. So how do we scope it, build it, validate it, maintain it? How do we use methods kind of at an intersection of social sciences, machine learning? Um, um, and then how do we connect a lot of these, the, our methodology for evaluation of these systems and metrics based on the outcomes that we want, the policy outcomes that we want, rather than the machine learning metrics that happen to exist for these types of things. Um, Projects, I talked about a lot of these, there are, some of those are ongoing, some there are new ones starting, so come talk to us if you're interested. And then on the research side, there are kind of three focus areas. I'll, I'll talk about second and third more. There's sort of one research area, so a lot of the problems that I talked about, when we use sort of off the shelf methods and tools, they work, they work better than the world today, but they don't, they're not perfect, there's a lot of um, um, room for, for improvement, right? Um, and so, a lot, because a lot of these methods are not designed for the needs of these problems, so one area of research, so how do we develop new methods that are targeted at the needs of these um, policy and social problems? Second is pretty much every problem I talked about, every project, is we're not making an automated prediction that's taking some automated action. Like, unlike add, uh, uh, just, you know, add clicks and, and, and uh, movie recommendations and all these different problems, those are all automated predictions and automated actions, right? There's no human that's sitting there trying to, to reorder these things. Every problem that I talked about, there is a human in the middle. Um, and so in the case of the police misconduct, the prediction goes to an internal affairs person who has to figure out not just whether they believe that prediction is correct or not, but also what do I do about this now? Which intervention do I give them? Um, in the case of the criminal justice, in the recidivism case, it's going to a team of people who are gonna go out and do proactive mental health outreach. It's, and so the, the prediction is a tool, is an additional information that's provided to these people to help them do a better job of what they were gonna do. And 
And so we kind of need to figure out how do we make this system um, useful to this human being so that the performance of the overall system increases. Because it's, if they don't take any action on what we just did, then the performance of our system is zero, right? It didn't do anything. Um, and so there's, there's some work, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the third area of focus would be sort of, again, a lot of the times when we look at these types of, a lot of the use of machine learning and AI and all these things in government has, has historically been to achieve efficiency. Right? It's, it's, I have limited resource, I can only help 300 people, how do I figure out which 300 people? And often if you're focusing on efficiency, you might be doing it at the cost of equity, uh, where the people who are easiest to help, um, are cheapest to help, might not be the ones who need your help the most. Um, and, and so the idea is how do we design our machine learning systems that are thinking about equity first, right? It's not about efficiency first. How do we balance, um, how do we take our policy goals? Because you know, every politician is gonna talk about equity. But how are you actually implementing it um, at a systems level? There's a lot of sort of work we've been doing. Um, and I'm gonna skip through all of that. So, so yeah, so there's one area kind of where we're focusing on interpretability um, of these types of systems. And the reason for that, you know, there's clearly the 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 first reason is for ourselves, right? When we build these systems, we have to be able to debug them. And if we see a prediction, we want to, before we even give it to somebody else, we want to be able to say, does it make sense? And if, if we can't get that, then, then you know, we're just passing on, on garbage to other people. The other thing is we have to give these explanations because, again, this person in the middle has to trust the system. And if they don't trust it, they don't use it. If they don't use it, it's all a waste of time. Um, this is interesting because this is not necessarily in a lot of problems, you know, the prediction is the goal, where if I can predict something early, I can do something. And so the lead poisoning case, that was the case, is if I can predict this kid is gonna get lead poisoning, the intervention is sort of obvious. It's removed the source of lead, which is most likely in their home. But in the case of the police misconduct, the intervention is not obvious. It could be one of many interventions that could work. Um, for um, kids who might not graduate school in time, there's not, there's not you know, an automatic intervention. It might be because they're having, you know, they have issues that something is going on at home. It might be because they're not doing well in certain things. It might be because they need help with, with getting to school. It's a transportation issue. It's a health issue. Um, and having explanations for these predictions hopefully helps individuals who are helping them figure out what intervention to, to give them. Um, and then more and more, this is becoming important as more government regulations are coming in around these systems where you told me that you know you didn't give me this intervention why what's my what, what's the reasons you have to kind of go go back and explain um, and there's a lot of work going on in this area right now around interpretability I'm not going to talk about that um, I sort of want to just quickly talk about how do we think about what a good explanation is right um, when it when a machine learning model says I predicted this person to be high risk because X. Um, what we want ideally is the system should be able, to, you know, it should be understandable, but also cor correct, right? It should reflect what the model actually did. Um, and there's one paradigm which is basically says, well, the computer is right. I know my machine learning system is right. I just need to convince the human that the system is right. Um, in a lot of the problems I, I talked about, you know, let, let's take the, the lead poisoning case. Are the, off the people that were asking the, the, the inspectors to go and inspect, we're right on 40% of them. Off the police officers about, again, same thing, under 50%. So it turns out, and now that sounds, you know, like, why are we doing this? Well, it's still better than what they're doing today. It's because these are really rare events, which is good. Um, but it doesn't mean, it basically means that most of the time the computer is wrong. Right? So assuming the computer is right, it has to convince the human is, 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 is a pretty dangerous path. And so what we're thinking about here is we don't know the computer is right or wrong. We want to basically, the explanation module's goal is to reinforce the correct predictions of the machine and help the human uh, reverse or overturn the wrong predictions. Right? Because if, if, if the predictions don't change, then, then the system is sort of hasn't improved. But the idea is, so if you, if you kind of evaluate 
So let's say you have a machine learning model, you give it to a human decision maker, and they agree or disagree with part of it, and let's say it's overall 70% right. Our hope is that inserting this in the middle increases the performance of the system, increases the outcomes that we care about. Um, because if this doesn't do anything, then it'll be still 73%. If this um, convinces them the computer is right all the time, it's probably going to go lower. And if this convinces them the computer is right when it's right and, and, and finds explanations that are suspicious um, to then, you know, the, the human decision maker sort of reverses them, then the overall system gets better. So that's sort of the setup we're thinking about is how do we build systems that are collaborating with people to help them achieve the policy outcomes that they, that they care about. And then on the bias and fairness side, the work we're doing is sort of trying to go through, I mean, in the time, what time did I have before? Okay. Uh, uh, so this is basically some idea of like what, often we think about sort of our system is biased because we built a biased machine learning model. And, and that's maybe true, but it turns out, you know, the systems are biased because the world is biased. Uh, and because the people working on them, us, we're biased. We take our implicit biases, and, and, and sometimes we might, bias doesn't mean necessarily bad here, right? We might tune the system and say, oh, I don't want to use that data source because that data source might be bad. Well, that's our subjective decision. Um, or it may be that the data is bad. Uh, I, I only sampled from people who use iPhones. Um, or my outcome is, is biased because the, 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 the team at a police department decides whether use of force was justified or not might be biased. Uh, they might not think, you know, they might think everything is justified. Um, so that's gonna show up in your data. Or you might, your system might be too complex. Um, or everything is great, your model is wonderful. Every, the data is perfect, there's no bias anywhere. And then you intervene, and your interventions are biased. You're, they're more effective for certain types of people than other people, and that results in the overall system being biased. So this, the, the point of this sort of trying to think about, for a given problem, detecting these different sources of bias, because if you can't figure out where it's coming from, it's gonna be very hard to correct them. And then having ways of dealing with each of them, right? So, so when we, for example, very simple things, right? When we're, when we're building a large system that uses data, we can see the bias can creep in in a bunch of different places. We often worry about this part. A lot of the work today is around here. But even simple things like when you have data and you let's say you have people's uh, heights and you're doing imputation. And let's say your data was 90% men and 10% women and you just did mean imputation. Now you made all the women look like men in your data. And that's gonna have issues downstream when you're gonna have this biased analysis because you didn't think about that people are different uh, because you're just running the mean imputation function, right? So there are a lot of ways of thinking about, we're kind of looking at, you know, same over here in some of the record linkage work and all these things. Um, and so the, the research that we're focusing on in this area is how do we define what, what bias or fairness or equity means for a specific program? Because there's no generic definition. Um, Things like, you know, if, you're, if we're doing something that's helping people, uh, so let's say providing them with you know, lead uh, inspections or mental health outreach, then missing people disproportionately, like false negatives are bad, right? If you have higher false positive negatives for, for uh, people living in some part of the city versus others, that's bad. If your interventions are, I mean, false positives are wasted resources, but it may not be as bad as false negatives. Whereas if you're doing interventions that are punitive, that might hurt people, false positive disparities are much worse. So thinking about how many people you're intervening with, all these different things, you kind of sort of think about what is, what, how do you define what disparity and bias and fairness means for this program, which means for this type of intervention, for this type of outcome, how do we build methods to detect when that is happening into a system? How do we build methods to understand the root cause of these types of biases? How do we, if we can, reduce the, the, the disparities in this system? And then if we can't reduce it, how do we actually mitigate the impact of the system being biased? How do we change the interventions? Um, because again, our goal is we want the overall program, we want the policy outcomes to be fair or equitable, 
we don't care if, this, if the, the machine learning model is, is fair or not. Right? Those two are, don't have to be the same thing. Um, and so when I kind of skip through all of this, but there's a lot of work going on here. We have a tool that we built um, that audits machine learning models for um, bias and fairness so that governments and nonprofits kind of working on these things can get this audit report that says you have disproportionate false positives for black people, or you will have you know, uh, disproportionate disparity for um, false positives. And, and then, yeah, and then we're kind of finding things that, you know, today, if you're looking at kind of just a performance metric and you say, ah, I'm going to pick this one, this is just a cartoon, right? And you sort of look at bias and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm okay with, with you know, what about this one? Which one do you care about more? Do you, you know, this one is only this much worse in performance, but, but huge reduction in bias. And it turns out this is, even though this is a, you know, uh, an illustrative example, in practice, you do get these types of things. You get, um, you know, this is bias on, on gender and performance. And it turns out these two models are, you know, similar performance, but, but much, less, much less bias. And then we see that repeatedly in, in, you know, this is a real problem with diabetes screening, which I'm not gonna go into. Uh, we'll skip that, actually. We can have a different session. We can talk about this, this problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I was gonna talk about some other stuff. Yeah, so I'll, 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 there's another research area I've been, I've been working on, which is, you know, which is research on copy. And so if people are interested in you know, building machine learning models for, uh, we can talk about it later as well. Uh, uh, there's a lot of data there, and apparently uh, it's good for the world, right? Uh, so yeah, so overall, you know, kind of the, the point of this was to give you an idea of, sort of what types of work is going on right now at this intersection if, uh, using machine learning, AI, and, and policy problems, social problems, and then kind of go into you know, the things out there today are a good start, but we need a lot, of, lot more work in some of these areas. Uh, and what we have an opportunity is we, we, we have really good partnerships with governments and NGOs that allows us to sort of, to one, help them, but also um, help develop new things that help them have an impact, right? Because sitting on our computers, we're gonna have very little impact. <laughs> like the people who are actually taking, we're not doing any interventions, we're, we're, we're no. So the idea is how do we collaborate with people who are actually trying to do something out there in the field, and how do we help them um, improve their outcome because that's the way we're gonna have our impact. Um, so if any of this sounds interesting, um, happy to chat more. Um, and I said, there's a class next semester, there's a summer fellowship, and there are ways of getting involved in projects and research. Um, so come, come talk to us. We're also launching something. This is kind of like a virtual place for people to collaborate on these types of projects where governments and non-geos will submit projects and people can volunteer. So we're gonna be launching that um, soon. Uh, if you're interested in helping with that, let me know. But yeah, so I know this went a little bit longer, but thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Uh, yeah, questions, comments? So where does the money come from for this type of work? How do you Trees. make sure that you're, <laughs> how do you make sure that you're working in the parts of the world and on the issues that uh, often get the least attention but are, because of that, the most pressing issues? <sighs> um, yeah, so those two questions are, are mutually exclusive now. Because uh, the money is often in places where they don't have needs and, and, and vice versa. No, I think, I think it's a good, good question. So a lot of this work, there, there are generally two sources of funding for this work. One is um, foundations and rich people. Um, and it's perfectly fine to make rich people feel guilty about, you know, uh, because uh, <laughs> And so it's important, yeah. It, it, it's good for them. Uh, uh, but but so the, and the second source of funding is the organizations themselves, right? What we found is it's hard for them to go and start fund something like in the beginning because it's uncertain, it's exploratory. But once you've done a prototype and then given them a business case for this, then they're able to get resources. And a lot of the governments and NGOs, I mean, they have money. They're wasting money in a lot of other places. 
Uh, they're giving money to large you know, vendors to buy things that they actually don't need. Um, and so, so that's been the source of funding for this work mostly is um, foundations, donors, and, and direct contracts with governments. Um, the, the second question is, is a longer, harder question to answer. And it's because you can sort of start by saying that the highest need is in this area, in this region. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you then have to look at with the tools and skills that you have and the link, the networks and the infrastructure, what is your probability of having an impact on that biggest need, right? So, so if that is low, even though the need is high, the expected value is, is pretty low. And so a lot of this work, we've kind of played this balancing game of how do we do it in a way that allows us to show. So if I went to the, the, the problem with the highest need, the place with the highest need, they might not even want my help. It's like we, we don't, and they would most likely have no data uh, and no technology infrastructure. And so I couldn't really do anything there. But by doing projects in other areas where, where you can show impact, you can motivate them to, to build some of that infrastructure, to collect the data, uh, and then you can go and help them. Right? So the idea has, well, a lot of the work we've been doing is, in the beginning, a lot of it was within the US. And now we've been kind of moving out more because we're finding infrastructure is now beginning to exist. And you can use that. So it's a, it's, it's a longer <laughs> conversation, happy to have. But I think, I think you have to kind of combine the two things there. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a good, that's again, I mean, the, the, the key thing in that question is there is a, a, an algorithm, there is a human, and then there is the system, the criminal justice system. And both the human and the algorithm are parts of the criminal justice system. And so we kind of need to look at the overall system, right? So I know there's a lot of talk about Compass. Compass is not and was not bad. Compass was basically following the guidelines they were given to build. And so if you talk to the Compass people, and if you, if there's a ProPublic article, and then there's a rebuttal to that. And they both are saying, Compass is unfair. Uh, and that's saying, no, Compass is fair. They're just looking at different metrics. And it's because the criminal justice system did not give the metric to optimize for. So just like you know, when, you, when you see examples of you know, Google's image recognition thing misclassifies black women. Uh, much more than you know, um, white women. It's it's not the fault of the system. It's the fault of the human who didn't put that as a metric that they cared about. If you were evaluating that system on every race and every gender separately, you would see these disparities. If you evaluate on, I want to maximize the overall accuracy of the system, then you don't care about it. So you can't blame the system for the human's <laughs> fault, right? And I think that's where. At least from my side, it's it's trying to teach people who are going to build, who are going to procure these systems and build these systems and evaluate them and deploy them and maintain them. They kind of need this training to understand what are the metrics I should I care about? What is my outcome that I care about? How do I implement it into my system? How do I evaluate it? So, the you know it, it's it's one is just knowing that these things exist. Second is how do I build them? Because um, I think it's it's very easy to blame a a computer for stuff. Uh, but you can't blame an algorithm for doing what it was told to do. Like it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't have any other goals. It just says, you told me to optimize for accuracy or fairness on this metric, I did that. Um, you should have told me something else if you wanted something else. But I'm sorry. To no, 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 please. Uh, but don't you think it reinforced some of the judgment? Maybe I mean there, there's been very if you that, so for one thing there have been they've been doing s some trials over the last couple of years especially around recidivism, um, but the system they've been trialing is very much like the the hand built system right so somebody people sat down they built the system and then uh, a lot of different counties have been evaluating, and what you want to evaluate is is does it result in 
what is the outcome that we care about, right? So the near-term outcome they care about is, is recidivism. But that may not be the long-term outcome, right? Just because they're not coming back doesn't mean their outcomes are great. But some judges, so it depends on you talk to different judges, some of them will say, uh, well, I, I released this person because the computer told me to. Well, then, then why are you there? Uh, because I think today, the, again, the system sort of doesn't really explain very well why. It doesn't tell them what data sources were used. So it's not really a collaborative system. It's, it's one data point that says six points. And greater than four points means you should, you should release them. And, and, and under four points means you shouldn't release them. And, and so it's not really a thing that they're used to even. They don't understand how it works. They don't really understand how to interact with it. They don't really know how to modify it. If they say, yeah, but using this data from four years ago and we had a different policy at that place, that's not an interaction they can have. So I agree with you that the interaction is important. We don't, at this point, it's so early to know what the, what's happening, um, how many people change their decisions based on it, how many post hoc justify following what the computer said. Uh, and there have been cases where people went and, you know, somebody was released on bail, they killed somebody, they went to the judge and the judge said, I was just following the computer. Um, and I don't think that's an excuse, but today we don't even measure judges' performance. There's no evaluation for judges. Uh, so I think there's a lot of stuff in the criminal justice system that has to change. And I think computers can play a small part, but the bigger issue is not a, not a computers biasing humans issue. I think it's the humans biasing computers is a, is a bigger problem. So. Talking about the project here over here with recidivism, mm -hmm. and I understand that we talk a lot about how randomly controlled trials are the best way of evaluating a treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever have any personal reservations for in that case when you're randomly assigning people to get the, this outreach versus not? Yeah, I mean that's always been a an, an issue in you know what are the ethics of, of not providing interventions to people who might need it or if there's a if there's a benefit that they can get and if um, and vice versa providing interventions if that might be a harm to them um, and I think I think for a lot of these things it's different if you're personally I I think. For some of these problems, at least where we're looking at them, um, there's a huge capacity issue anyway. So it doesn't make it better, but the ethical choice is less fuzzy. Like I, I'm not going to be able to help all of them today. I'm going to have to pick some small number anyway. Today they're picking them in ad hoc way that doesn't help them learn and it doesn't help people tomorrow. So this way of of testing it. Yes, if, if it's going to leave some people out who otherwise would have gotten the thing, but then it's hopefully the, it's going to help more people tomorrow by, by learning if it works or not. And so I think that for me, the thing is, like, if I knew this worked, then I would have much more personal reservations about it. But I, have no, I don't know. And especially with one of the things we're doing, which you know, Kit was working on quite a bit, was even in the trial, who do we intervene on to figure, like, what do we want to learn from the trial? because our sample sizes cannot be lar too large. And so we can sort of say, well, we wanted to stratify across the whole set and see how it, what, who, who this intervention is effective for. But we can't. And so then we said, well, what if we focus it on the people at the highest risk? Well, if we do that, we may not be able to change outcomes. This intervention may not be effective for the people who are highest at risk of recidivism. And so if we focus it all then we find it doesn't work, then what do we do next? So we sort of ended up kind of stratifying, taking people at the top high risk, but then also the, the middle risk levels to, with the assumption that it might be more effective for these people. So let's test it. We didn't sample from the very bottom because we thought even if it was effective, it would need to be so large to have an effect that it may not be worth. For, and so, so I think, and again, this is, this is a one-off. I'm describing it as a one-off thing, right? But, but ideally, it's sort of this iterative process where you're running these trials all the time to figure out who is being benefited from which intervention. And then, then you just implement that as policy. And then you take the rest and say, how do I design new interventions for the people who are being left behind from this intervention? And then test those and then kind of keep going as a, as a live system as opposed to the standard today is you do this one analysis and you do this one trial. And then that's it. The policy is set um, because that's not how the world works. So, I, I share your concerns, and I think, I think 
Unfortunately, the resource constrained world makes it a little bit easier to make that call, but it's still, yeah, it is still uncomfortable, especially if you had to see these people and say, no, I'm, I'm gonna skip you because when I randomized it, you came, that's painful. Uh, yeah. So question, um, there's a lot of different corporations that are using these types of tools all the time. I'm pretty sure there was a good access to the uh, power to your team here. I'm mm -hmm. kind of taking the same technology from the web and IT. Yeah. How can we realistically fight back against that using the same tools to counteract so is, is the worry that they shouldn't be allowed to use these tools, or they shouldn't be allowed to do bad things in general? Or, or I mean, you're asking about the intersection. I'm sort of asking you about it. Sure. Uh, well, I guess I mean, everybody has the right to use the tools however they choose to do so, as long as it's not illegal. But so that's one, one, but one method, is to make them illegal. The moral question of like, this whole premise of this talk was using it for social good, right? Yeah. So if it's very easy Yeah. <laughs> how, much, how much time do we have? Uh, uh, we can just go over to the, the DOD talk uh, and ask this question there. Uh, um, I mean, I think, I think here's, so the way, you know, a lot of the work that, that I'm describing isn't necessarily developing completely new methods that didn't exist, and now that I've de we've developed them for these things, it can be used for evil. Um, but I think that the point you're making is, is fair in that there are organizations using them for you know, some neutral, some evil things, um, subjective. In our opinion, they're evil. They will probably have some justification, uh, making the world safer or something like that. Um, but I think the question is how do we, so one set of people who are gonna go work there, if you care about kind of doing things the right way, how do we enable people like that to sort of have, a, have, have an influence uh, of changing. Um, and I think, I mean, one thing is we can use capitalism against them, right? Like, hey, if you, the kind of people who are going to work there care about these things, then, and you're gonna go and say, we care about these things, then, uh, and we're not gonna come work for you. And if that creates a market where people who are, who are good can get hired by people who care about these types of things more than maybe that's, again, it's not a solution. I think the other thing is to do is to figure out, I mean, for, in my mind, it's, when I was asking you, you know, do you want them not to do evil? I think if that's the goal, then the tool in, in some ways is almost irrelevant, right? If they're, if they're gonna do horrible things, keeping away certain things from them, they're gonna find other ways. <laughs> they'll build it themselves, they'll figure something out. So I think the question is, how do we, how do we monitor, regulate, like, Again, regulation is, is, is useful in some of these places where we have to think about. But the people who are regulating today have no idea about these types of things. I mean, like a year ago, something was an event with a bunch of attorneys in general from different states, and they're getting complaints about a lot of these things, and they have no clue. Like, how do we, what does it mean to audit a system like this? Do we ask them for their models? Do we ask them for their source code? Do we ask them for their data? Do we ask them for their predictions? Do we, like, all of them. Uh, like, do we have like a, a, a template where we can use to just, just check for these things? Like, no, you have to go through, just the code doesn't help you, uh, just the data doesn't help you, and they don't have the training and they don't have people in their organizations who can help them figure this out. So I think that's another approach, is how do we make it harder for them to, to find loopholes? Like, well, we're, we're not using any field, any race field in our data, that, that, that's, that's, that's good enough. Like, no, that's not good enough. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of where we can come in, right? But I think the bigger, the bigger answer for what is it, and I mean, I think that the, the thing that, I, that I'm gonna just sort of, you know, like I can't, we can't change what society wants, right? I think if, if, the, if the world we wanna live in wants to be a world where these companies can't do these things, then, then it's a bigger problem than 
than machine learning and AI. <laughs> uh, and I know it's sort of a throwaway answer, like not, not our problem, but, but it is our problem. I think I don't have a good answer for how do we how do we incentivize people to not do this? How do we enable them to, to, if you're at a company and you feel something unethical is happening, implicitly or explicitly, how do you deal with it as opposed to you know, ignore it? Or, and I think there are some of these conversations are happening in small pockets, um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't have a good you know, answer where we can fix these things. But, and then we're losing people. <laughs> Thank you all very much.